good afternoon. I am Liz McGinley. I am a tax partner in the New York office of Bracewell. Welcome to today's program on the future of carbon capture, use, and storage projects. We're very pleased with the significant interest that we've received in this program. We welcome your questions throughout the program, and we will respond to them after the webinar. We have great speakers today. On the topic of energy transition, we'll have Michael Girard of Columbia Law School and the Sabin Center for Climate Change. On the topic of secured geological storage, we'll have Nigel Gendy, who is the head of carbon management at Gaffney Klein. And on the topic of contractual considerations, we'll have Martha Kamoon, a partner at Bracewell in New York. And with that, I will turn this over to Michael Girard to speak to us on the topic of energy transition. Thanks very much, Liz. Uh, so I'm first going to talk about carbon capture, and then I'm going to talk about use and storage. Uh, carbon capture, of course, is capturing carbon dioxide before it gets out into the atmosphere from an industrial process uh, through a smokestack or whatever means. And it's a very important part of the energy transition. This is a scenario from the International Energy Agency of the uh, global energy transition that they see under their sustainable development scenario out to the year 2040. And as you can see, looking toward the bottom, uh, CCS is 9% of what they are counting on for the energy transition. It's not as much as efficiency in renewables, but it's a good deal more than nuclear. Uh, so it's a very important part of the energy transition. However, CCS on itself is not enough. One of the things that's going to be needed is actually to remove some of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, we're going to continue to have uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to uh, draw that down. Uh, these are projections out to the year 2100 of an, of an energy transition scenario. And it shows that uh, by around the 2070 or so, it's gonna be necessary to be moving to an area of net negative emissions, which is going to involve, among other things, uh, carbon capture for the remaining sources of uh, fossil fuel emissions and uh, removing uh, the CO2 from the atmosphere through other forms of, uh, of carbon dioxide removal. Carbon capture is already in use. Uh, in a number of industrial applications around the world. Uh, one of the largest current applications is through uh, in, in natural gas uh, processing and extraction facilities. Uh, this is a picture of one of the largest carbon capture units in the world, um, an Exxon uh, facility in Wyoming at their Chute Creek uh, gas processing facility. Carbon capture is now beginning to be used at, in coal-fired power plants. This is the NRG Petra Nova plant in Texas, and carbon capture was retrofitted onto that plant. Uh, and so it, it, this has been operational for about three years. We're beginning to see carbon capture in other applications. Uh, this is an integrated steel plant in Abu Dhabi, uh, and it has been retrofitted with uh, carbon capture equipment. So let me explain this chart to you. It, it, it's meant to demonstrate that there are actually a wide variety of current and proposed applications for uh, carbon capture. If we look down the column on the left, you see the different kinds of applications st starting at the bottom with power generation, then moving up to natural gas processing, fertilizer production, uh, hydrogen production, production iron and steel production, chemicals, cement, and waste incineration. Um, the horizontal column uh, represents the year, and so the items that are in red are operational. Those are operational facilities, and the size of the circle uh, shows the, the volume of CO2 that is captured. So we have quite a few carbon capture uh, facilities in operation around the world and quite a few more that are uh, now in design or development. I also mentioned that it's necessary to draw some CO2 uh, 
out of the atmosphere. And I want to focus here on in the middle, we see direct air CO2 capture. So that's another kind of, ca of carbon capture, but it would be to withdraw the CO2 from the atmosphere. To the right of that, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage is a different technology that involves growing crops for a particular or a vegetation for a particular uh, purpose, uh, burning it in controlled conditions, uh, using the energy, and capturing the CO2. Uh, the other items here, uh, forestry and enhanced weathering and so forth, are not industrial operations that are relevant to um, our discussion today. So all of this has been about the capture of carbon dioxide. Once you capture it, you need to do something with it. The most common use of captured CO2 today is enhanced oil recovery. CO2 uh, is ingest, uh, injected uh, typically at high pressure to a subsurface formation where much but not all of the oil has been extracted. And the pressure from the CO2 helps extract and push out more of the oil. So it, uh, the CO2 comes down and the and the oil uh, comes up. Uh, but this is only one of the ways that carbon dioxide could be uh, uh, utilized or stored. So what this is um, showing is the variety of different pathways. Um, uh, to the, you know, lower to the right, you see sequestration. That is just um, putting the carbon dioxide in a deep geologic formation, either uh, underground or offshore under the seabed. Uh, technologies are being developed for that. Not, not utilizing it in any way, just sequestering it hopefully uh, for a very long term. Uh, to the right of that, we see uh, utilization and then non-conversion, just using the CO2 as CO2. If we go down to the lower right and we see um, enhanced oil recovery, which I just talked about. Um, it can also be used to for enhanced coal bay coal bed methane to push out methane from coal bed methane formations and, and extract it for use as energy, as natural gas. And it can also be used to enhance geothermal uh, production. Um, CO2 can also be um, used to combine with brines from desalinization processes. Then to the upper right, we see conversion. Um, the uh, CO2 can be converted either chemically into liquid fuels or polymers or urea, mostly for use in fertilizer. It can be converted biologically uh, to enhance algae uh, cultivation. It can be converted through mineralization uh, through a number of processes that allow it to be incorporated into um, uh, concrete and uh, uh, a number of other industrial applications. So there's a lot of work being done uh, in R&D to figure out additional ways to utilize captured CO2. Um, some of the items that are shown here are now in active uh, commercial operation. Uh, some of them are still in the R&D phase. Uh, but this is meant to show that there is tremendous uh, potential uh, to utilize the captured CO2 um, if there are sufficient um, economic incentives to, uh, to do that. One of the most important economic incentives uh, for using that is uh, 45Q, and I'm now going to turn it back to Liz to talk about that. Thank you, Michael. This portion of the presentation focuses on the federal income tax credits that are available under Section 45Q of the code as amended by the Bipartisan Budget Act in 2018. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is what we refer to as the new rules, which only applies for projects placed in service after February 8, 2018. The amendment in 2018 dramatically expanded the credits that are available um, and incentivized carbon capture. But importantly, the amended statute lacked important details about qualifying for the credit, storage standards for carbon oxide, 
recapture rules, and other issues deterring reliance on the credit by developers and investors. But since then, there's been subsequent guidance by the IRS in the form of notices and revenue procedures, and most importantly, proposed regulations from Treasury and the IRS that were quite extensive and released in the end of May of this year. So what is the Section 45Q credit? Well, first, it's a tax credit based on the metric tons of qualified carbon oxide that is captured using carbon capture equipment at a qualified facility. And then, as Michael described, it's either disposed of in secure geological storage, used as an injectant for EOR, or used as a feedstock to produce fuels, chemicals, or other products that effectively store the carbon oxide. What is qualified carbon oxide? First, it must be captured and stored or used within the United States. It can come from one of two sources. It can come from an industrial source, a power plant, a refinery, or an other type of manufacturing facility are some examples. Or, as Michael mentioned, it can be direct air capture, pulling carbon dioxide out of the ambient air. It does not include carbon oxide that is recaptured or re-injected in the EOR process. It also does not include the capture of carbon oxide from natural springs or formations. What is carbon capture equipment? Well, that is defined by the function of the equipment. And it includes the components of property that are used to capture or process the carbon oxide up until the point where it's transported. So it would include equipment that's used to capture it, compress it, treat it, process it, liquefy the carbon oxide, or perform some other physical function with respect to the carbon oxide. The, it does exclude transport property. So it would not include such things as pipelines or vessels used to transport the captured carbon oxide to another point where it's either disposed of or utilized. And then what is a qualified facility for purposes of these credits? And there's some very important limitations on what is a qualified facility. First and foremost, uh, these credits as of now are only available for qualified facilities for which construction begins before January 1, 2024, and that's not in the distant future. That's coming up very quickly. So how do you know when you can say that construction has begun on your carbon capture project? Well, there are two main tests. One is the physical work test, when you have performed work of significant nature, and then there's a 5% safe harbor. If these terms sound familiar to you, it's probably because you've seen them in the context of wind and solar projects where developers are seeking the, the investment tax credit or the production tax credit. They're very, very similar um, from their use in that context. So let's first start, about, start to talk about the physical work test. That's a facts and circumstances test. And it focuses on the nature of the work that is done, not necessarily the amount and uh, there is no bright line rule, and it counts work done by the taxpayer or work conducted uh, pursuant to a binding contract entered into by the taxpayer. It includes both on-site work, which naturally would include things like building foundations, installing equipment. It also includes off-site work, such as the manufacture of components so long as those components were not in inventory or typically held in inventory by vendors. Importantly, you can't count work done in preliminary activities. And what is a preliminary activity? It's any sort of planning. So it's the research, obtaining financing, obtaining permits. That work can't be included for purposes of the physical work test. Many taxpayers prefer to rely on the 5% safe harbor. And again, this is a safe harbor when you have paid or incurred at least 5% of the total cost of the project. And this is a bright line rule. And it counts all the, all the costs of the project that go into the depreciable basis. However, 
if you incorrectly estimate the total cost of the project and you end up having overruns. So at the end of the end of the project, you realize that the, in, in the year you claimed that construction began, you in fact did not incur 5% of the total actual cost you will be de deemed to have failed that test retroactively. However, you still have the opportunity to claim start of construction under the physical work facts and circumstances test. Now, whether you rely on the physical work test or whether you rely on the 5% safe harbor, you also need to show that you continually work towards completion. And you can do that on a facts and circumstances basis but many taxpayers rely on the continuity safe harbor. And that is you will be deemed to have met this continuity requirement if you place the project in service within six calendar years. So for example, if you started construction at any time in 2021 under these rules, you must place the project in service by the end of 2027 in order to be in this continuity safe harbor for purposes of start of construction transfers of the project um, between one taxpayer and another between the time that construction begins and the project in, is placed in service are perfectly appropriate and don't disturb um, meeting either requirement. Also, there's an allowance if you're retrofitting a facility and it allows you to qualify as placing a project in service after February of 2018 which would allow you to utilize these new, more favorable 45Q credits, if the used components do not constitute more than 25%, more than 20% of the total value. Another important aspect of qualified facilities is they must meet minimum emissions and capture thresholds. Those are set forth in section 45Q based on the type of your facility. There's also an allowance if in the first year you're only operating for a portion of the year and the amount of emissions or capture is low for that reason, that you're able to annualize um, your emissions or capture in the first year to allow you to meet these threshold tests. So how do we calculate this credit? Again, as I said, the credit is based on the metric tons of carbon oxide that have been captured. And the credit is available for the first 12 years after the facility is placed in service. And these dollar amounts are based on the metric ton, and you'll see that there are two different um, measurements of credit. Credits for disposal, just pure disposal facilities of the CO2, and another set of credits if you're using the carbon oxide for injection in EOR or for utilization in, as a feedstock or other purpose. And you'll see that the credits increased in both cases between 2017 and 2026, with the disposal credits maxing out at $50 per metric ton, and the other credits for injection or utilization maxing out at only $35 per metric ton, presumably because taxpayers who are capturing the carbon oxide and then, which is then used for injection or utilization, are, are obtaining revenue by selling that carbon oxide for one of those purposes. These credits do obviously extend beyond 2026, but they only increase thereafter by a stated inflation factor. Something that was not detailed in the statute 45Q when it was amended in 2018 is the details around credit recapture. You know, what is the risk that something goes wrong and I later lose my credits. And this was a great concern to both developers of carbon capture equipment as well as potential investors. They wanted to know what the parameters were uh, for, for a risk of loss of the credit. And this was included in the proposed regulations that came out at the end of, the, end of last month, and they were fairly favorable. Uh, most notably, the proposed regulations provide that recapture of credits only occurs if the amount of leakage for the project in any taxable year exceeds the amount stored or injected in the same year. So you only have recapture if you have a net decrease in the carbon oxide stored, counting the new carbon captured in that year. So it doesn't seem extremely likely in the life of a project 
when it's capturing vast amounts of carbon dioxide, that there would be a net leakage. It seems more likely that you would have a risk of credit recapture after you have ceased to capture significant amounts of carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide is just being stored either in underground formations or in oil and gas wells through EOR. As I said, the credit recapture measurement is determined separately for each project. And, it's, and the amount of the recapture is, is determined on a LIPO basis, last in, first out. What do I mean by that? That means if there is leakage of CO2 and it's measured, you treat that as offsetting the amount of carbon dioxide captured in the immediately prior taxable year and the credit associated with it, and then the subsequent year going back um, for up to five years. The recapture period ends after the earlier of five years after the last credit is claimed or the date monitoring ends. So the recaptured credit amount is added back to the tax liability of the taxpayer who took the credit in the year the leakage occurs. If the recapture relates to multiple units of equipment used in carbon capture, then the recapture of the credits is allocated pro rata among those units. And if the credit was taken by multiple taxpayers, the credit recapture is allocated amongst those multiple taxpayers in the relevant year for that project. It's important to note that there's an example that shows that even if a taxpayer owned a project and sold it prior to the leakage, it can be still at risk of credit recapture. So for example, if a taxpayer owned a carbon capture equipment and operated it from 2020 to 2024, um, and then sold the project in 2025, and a leakage occurred in the underground storage in 2026, equal to the amount of carbon oxide captured in both 2025 and 2024 before the sale, the seller could be subject to recapture of their credits on that basis. So you'd be one, one to be very careful of that when contracting for the sale of carbon capture equipment. Another very important element of the 45Q credits that was not um, clearly defined and described in the code section 45Q in 2018 is the meaning of secure geological storage and the measurement um, of the utilization of carbon oxide. And what it said in the code section is that it instructed the Secretary of Treasury to work with the EPA, the Secretary of Energy, and the Secretary of the Interior to establish regulations for adequate security measures for carbon oxide storage. Those were expanded upon in the proposed regulations. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Nigel Genby, who will get into greater detail about secure geological storage. Many thanks, Liz, and many thanks to the team at Bracewell for organizing and hosting this web webinar. It's also a pleasure to share some screen time with, uh, with Martha and Michael. As Liz said, my name is Nigel Genvy, and I'm Global Head of Carbon Management at Gaffney Klein, located in Houston, Texas. Um, Gaffney Klein is an international petroleum and energy consultancy that don't necessarily know of us. that has been operating worldwide for nearly 60 years now. Our work de-risks investment in the world's energy supply and the carbon management practice aims to de-risk energy investments through the energy transition, including CCUS. We've got considerable experience with CCUS projects and technology market assessments worldwide, over 65 at last count um, over the last two decades across the world and now increasing rapidly including assignments with some of the key players. I was alternate chair for the management committee of the US National Petroleum Council study on CCUS, which was completed in December 2019. And Gaffney Klein, we now host the cost assessment tool for CCUS for the NPC available on our website. As Liz mentioned, the focus of my talk today is going to be about secure geological storage of CO2 and the importance of an independent engineer and geologist certification 
in accordance to national and international standards to de-risk a project. I will start with some background on the issues regarding determining secure geological storage before moving to the current solutions being considered. So I've got to start with firstly the obligatory disclaimer statement. Uh, that's the phrase I usually use at least when I speak to the technical audiences who generally glaze over at this point. Not usually a good start, but um, to some on this webinar, this may actually be the most exciting slide. Um, but humor aside, this basically says that the content I will take you through today should not be used in isolation for decision making, and I am not a lawyer. So let's start at the beginning when CCUS was really put on the map um, as a low carbon technology, the IPCC 20, 2005 special report on CCS. I should note that we have at least one of the authors of this report in the audience, Bill Spence, who I, I've had the pleasure of working with at BP. Now to validate the role of CCS as a climate change mitigation technology, it's critical that the performance and permanence of CO2 in preventing removing it, the CO2 from the atmosphere is credibly delivered. As you can see from the highlighted areas in this slide, we are confident this can be achieved, but it needs to be done with care and attention. The IPCC report uh, indeed stated that for well-selected, designed and managed geological storage sites, the vast majority of CO2 will gradually be immobilized by, var by various trapping mechanisms, and <clears throat> in that case could be retained up for up to millions of years. Because of those mechanisms, storage in itself could become more secure over longer timeframes. So geological storage can also be done at scale. Deep saline formations hold the largest capacity potential for which we now have over 20 years of experience at the Sleipner project offshore Norway. And capacity estimates for these by the US government indicate a median 8,600 gigatons of CO2 storage capacity here in the US, indicating hundreds of years of storage potential in comparison to the 2.5 gigatons per annum target from large space, large scale stationary emission sources for CCUS. However, at the moment, of the approximately 40 million tons per annum of anthropogenic or man-made CO2 capture today, 32 million tons per annum, or 80%, is being used for enhanced oil recovery. The majority in the US, where CO2 is trapped in the subsurface as part of the process to boost oil recovery. This is a well-established practice that has been conducted for 50 years. This option for geological storage of CO2 provides an important additional revenue stream to help pay for capture, compression, and transport of the CO2. And there is more potential, as the IEA indeed itself estimates that by 2050, a cumulative of 60 gigatons of CO2 could be stored with conventional CO2ER practices. So what is secure geological storage? Um, here, there's really four key trapping mechanisms. One, structural, stratigraphic, and hydrodynamic. Second, residual phase. Thirdly, solubility and fourthly, mineralization. Now, at depths below 800 to 1,000 meters, CO2 becomes supercritical and has a liquid like density and provides the potential for efficient utilization of underground storage space and improves itself to cure um, geological storage. Now, a cap rock is fundamental, really, as a, it is a rock of very low permeability and acts as an upper seal to prevent fluid flow out of a reservoir and then up to the surface. Now, there are various options available to achieve verification of secure geological storage and clear performance-based methods implemented by thorough transparent and consistent processes by credible and capable organizations, of course, is key. Now, the US Section 45Q tax credit for CCUS, as Liz mentioned, requires adequate security me measures to be put in place for demonstration of CO2 geological storage so it does not escape into the atmosphere. So what has been the issue 
Now, whilst the EPA's Underground Injection Control Well Program and Greenhouse Gas Reporting Requirements are available for deep saline formations, there has been a question about what, if anything beyond current practice, is needed for the injection and geological storage of CO2 that occurs in conjunction with enhanced ore recovery. IRS um, indeed um, had a notice in 2009 that was provided given the absence at that point of the EPA's in underground injection control for well permitting and GHG reporting program specific to geological sequestration of CO2. It used itself um, 2006 IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories along with existing UIC rules. And that's important because, of course, this forms then the fundamental requirements of what, how to determine secure geological storage. So those IPCC guidelines, again, are relevant because they had three key aspects, conducting the site characterization by evaluating the geology, and then conducting an assessment of the risks of CO2 leakage. And then thirdly, monitoring potential leakage pathways over time. Then EPA did issue their regulations just a year later in 2010, and a class six UIC program for non-EOR geological storage and a greenhouse gas reporting program that included two subparts RR, requiring facilities conducting ge geological sequestration of CO2 to develop and implement an approved site-specific monitoring, reporting and verification, MRV plan, and to report the amount of, sequest of CO2 sequestered using a mass balance approach. This rule was, of course, complementary to the class six program for non-EOR wells, and it did, was permitted participation by class two wells opting in. It also had subpart UU, which required GHG reporting from all other facilities that inject CO2 underground for any reasons, of course, including EOR. And the EOR operators are also subject to reporting requirements under the Greenhouse Gas uh, Reporting Program for subparts W and C for above ground equipment leaks. So the question for EOR operators really has, that has been, is using man-made CO2 already for decades as to what do they need to do differently, if anything, from what they had already been doing safely and securely. So let's, let's have a quick, uh, what is done today by CO2 EOR operators? This slide gives an overview of how UIC class two and existing EPA greenhouse gas reporting uh, program is performed and itself can give a mass balance calculation of stored CO2. When operating practices and state regulations are also applied to the monitoring requirements to assure that CO2 does not escape into the atmosphere, you can see why some operators have felt that this has provided adequate, adequate security measures in the absence of any specific clarification from the IRS to access 45Q. But some have certainly expressed concerns about those approaches, mainly because some of the information isn't publicly accessible. And this has caused three enhanced ore recovery facilities to actually opt in to a subpart RR and have produced an MRV plan. An example is shown in the table on the right hand side. And as you can see, Many of the methods used for monitoring are actually part of existing ongoing operational practices within the oil and gas industry to undertake EOR. Now those MRV plans include um, the Northern Iagaran uh, Pinnacle Reef Trend um, and the Hobbs Field and Denver unit in, in Texas. Um, there have been also um, some non-EOR projects, Shoot Creek, uh, associated with some of the, the CO2 acid gas from the um, um, Labarge uh, project that Michael showed earlier on, and also the Illinois Industrial CCS project. Now, there are also alternative approaches available beyond existing practices and the EPA's subpart of our reporting, and that's what I'll get into next. 
So the IRS indeed asked what these technical criteria and other options are, and indeed specifically asked about the ISO for CCUS, to which many respondents uh, commented, including myself. The International Standards Organization, ISO, is an independent, non-governmental international organization, and the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, adapts ISO standards to the United States. So those ISO standards have been referenced in already other US federal regulations. For example, the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission referenced uh, ISO 1496 in its regulations on physical protection systems for the transport of special nuclear material. And ANSI itself also currently acts as the accreditation body for international GHG reporting for projects here in the United States. So many comments were received regarding these recently published ISO 27916 for CCUS, providing a relevant standard for demonstrating secure geological storage of CO2 injected in EOR operations. The adoption now by ANSI and also the British Standards Institution enhances the acceptance of CCUS and the energy projects um, and products to which CCUS is applied across regional and national borders. And that's, of course, very important for the products that are produced, because it now provides a framework to underpin trade through the removal of technical barriers and different regulations. So why is an alternative to EPA's greenhouse gas reporting program subpar RR needed anyway? And um, really, some operators consider that um, requiring subpar RR and the inference of intentional CO2 storage may create a misalignment with state mineral property and natural resource conservation laws, as well as accepted industry practice and commercial agreements. And of course, while some state reporting requirements also effectively de deliver the elements of subpar RR, for, but for associated storage, and I took you through those earlier on, the IRS, EPA, DOE, and DOI determined that those, of course, do provide, have complexity. They're not uniform and therefore would increase administrative burden. Therefore, indeed, the IRS have therefore proposed to allow the CSA ANSI ISO 27916 as an alternative to subpart RR. Now, documentation for that can be prepared internally by the taxpayer and must be provided then to a qualified independent engineer or geologist to certify the mass balance and the MRV plan. And so the question is then, who qualifies as an independent engineer or geologist? And how often does certification need to be done? I think certainly these are, these are some of the questions that still remain for um, entire clarification. But the independence of engineers or, or geologists to certify secure geological storage really, of course, underpins the, their value to ensure the quality of the action being taken and the environmental benefits of CCUS. So it's the best interest of everybody to ensure this. Now, another important consideration is the accreditation body, of course, ANSI provides a broad range of independent engineers and geologists to remove implementation barriers. And Certainly, there's been a lot of it experience um, in oil and gas, um, really by having professional standards of impartiality and competence, allowing actual staff within those organizations to be some of those certifiers. Now, of course, it's best practice for those individuals to come from other parts of the organization to ensure that they act independently in accordance to the accreditation body procedures. So independent verifiers, therefore, do not necessarily have to be third-party consultants. Now, in terms of the timing, how often does certification need to be done? It's really, there's two different things. There's the MRV plan, which is, of course, put in place um, for once for the entire project duration. And that has to be independently certified. Whilst also the annual mass balance calculations, of course, need to be certified to ensure no leakage to the atmosphere. But really, there's a, um, two different ways to look at the how often certification needs to be done. And so thank you for your time today. That's all I have uh, to, to cover. And I'll 
hand over um, back to uh, to Liz. Thank you. Now that we established how to qualify for the Section 45Q credit, we turn to what taxpayer is entitled to use the credit and how can it be transferred or monetized? So Section 45Q tells us that the taxpayer that owns the carbon capture equipment and either physically or contractually ensures the capture, disposal, use, or utilization of that carbon oxide is entitled to the credit. Well, what does it mean to contractually ensure any of that activity? It means that you've entered into a binding contract with the other party enforceable under state law that does not limit damages to any specified amount. But merely entering into a binding contract with another party does not entitle that party to any of the credit. Instead, the taxpayer that owns the carbon capture equipment that is entitled to the credit has the right to elect under the code on an annual basis to allow those taxpayers that dispose, utilize, or use as an ejectant the carbon oxide to claim all or part of the credit. The proposed regulations issued in the end of May expand upon this, and they're fairly generous. They allow the transfer of credits to multiple parties. It allows the transfers to be made in whole or part, but it limits the credit transfer to what would be proportional. So if a taxpayer owns carbon capture equipment and it contracts with two other taxpayers to provide storage facility services, each for 50% of the carbon oxide that is captured, the limit on the allocation of election to transfer credits to either party would be 50%. Another way to transfer credit is to utilize a partnership to own and operate the carbon capture project. Partnerships under federal income tax law are not subject to income tax. Instead, their income and also the credits that they generate are allocated to and taxed at the partner level. So you could bring in a partner to that project who makes an equity investment and allow it to receive an allocation of the 45 PU credits earned by that partnership. Who is typically a tax equity investor? It can be a financial or a strategic investor that has sufficient cash tax liability so that they benefit from the tax credits that flow through to them and they're able to utilize it to reduce their cash tax liability. This structure is particularly useful when the owner of the carbon capture project does not otherwise have cash tax liability because they're generating losses or they have a net operating loss carry forward. And therefore they can utilize the credits or monetize them by transferring the, them effectively to a tax equity investor who then earns his return in the form of cash distributions from the partnership as well as his share of credit. There are limitations, however, as to how these tax equity deals can be structured so that the allocation of the credits among the partners is respected for federal income tax purposes. Very helpfully, earlier this year in February, the IRS released RevProc 2020-12, which provides guidance for a safe harbor for allocating 45Q credits to tax equity investors. Very generally, the tax credits must be allocated to the partners in accordance with their interest in the partnership at the time the credits arrive. You can have special allocation. So in the IRS guidance, they list multiple requirements for complying with the safe harbor for the allocation of the partnership's credits to be respected among the members, but I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. And some of these, again, may sound familiar because they are elements of requirements for tax equity deals that were employed for the ITCs and PTCs in the wind and solar project. One is the investor must have a bona fide equity interest. And that's described in more detail in the guidance, but what it generally means is it has to have some of the hallmarks of equity. It has to be at risk of the performance of the partnership. It's not a fixed return, which is more commonly associated with a debt investment. Further, to meet the safe harbor requirements, 
you can't guarantee the credit or the cash equivalent of credit to the tax equity investor. However, there are some things to give the tax equity investor more comfort and, and assurance as to what its economic return will be out of this partnership. You can have in your contract at the partnership level performance guarantee that the providers will take, undertake the actions or omit to take actions necessary to claim the Section 45Q credit. You can also enter into long-term arm's length carbon oxide purchase agreements, including with related parties, which provide some assurance as to the long-term economic performance of the partnership. You also can seek third-party insurance as to the amount of credits to be received, so long as that is with an independent insurer and not coming from the partnership or from the other partners. Under the guidance provided, no call right on the, on the tax equity investors' interest is permitted, but they can have a put right so long as the put price is not above fair market value of the interest at the time that it is exercised. So here we have a general example of how a tax equity investment um, may look. This is very similar to the example that is provided in the revenue procedure that we, we're talking about here. And in this partnership, the developer would form the partnership to own and op operate the carbon capture equipment. Typically, the developer would construct the equipment and contribute it just before it is placed in service. And then initially, the income from the project and the credit can be allocated up to 99% to the tax equity investor, with a minimum 1% going to the developer. Now, the cash distributions, which are different from the allocations of income and credit, the cash distributions can change over the life of the project. So for example, initially 100% of the cash can go to the developer to provide a return to the developer. And then thereafter we can have a flip point where then 100% of the cash goes to the tax equity investor until it receives its negotiated after tax IRR on its invested capital. So then after the tax equity investor has achieved its desired return, it, there is a flip and the tax equity investor's interest dramatically declines where it's receiving a minimum of 5% of the partnership items including the credits and the cash distributions and all of the remaining economics are going to the developer. And at that point, the investor can exit through its put right if it, if it chooses over time. And next, I will hand the presentation over to my partner, Martha Kamoon in New York to discuss contractual considerations. Thank you very much, Liz. Over the next few slides, I will focus on certain contract considerations in what is essentially a three-party relationship between the carbon oxide producer, the carbon equipment owner and operator, and storage provider. For ease of presentation, I will use the word CO2, CCS, producer, capture, and storage provider, but please refer to the slides for the more precise terminology. Please also note that the following represent a list of considerations for contractual counterparties, meaning what they could be concerned with. And whether or not any will be achievable or permissible will depend on the facts of the transaction, the negotiation leverage of the parties, and further vetting under the IRS guidance and the restrictions contemplated there. Moving on to contractual relationships. The next three slides will focus on the relationships between the producer and capturer, capture and storage provider, and finally, capture and industrial operator. Starting with the relationship between producer and capturer. To set the stage, CCS projects are exposed to feedstock risk, which is not present in wind and solar transactions, or even in direct air capture projects for that matter, unless we reach a point where there's too little CO2 in the air, but that would be a very good problem to have. Generally, CCS projects could thus have some exposure to the industry in which the carbon generating facility operates. And some industries pose a viability concern. For example, will a CO2 generating facility be around to supply CO2 for 12 years, which is the duration of the credit? There are also industry operational issues. For example, 
a natural gas plant may be curtailed at certain times and is generally exposed to the fluctuations of the power market. This may have an impact on the availability of CO2 for capture. The quality and quantity of the CO2 are also key, and some industries, such as ammonia plants, are more reliable producers of CO2 than others. And so the parties will attempt to address these and other issues in their documents. For example, some of the more obvious asks of capture may be focused on in discussions with a producer and with varying degrees of success are a minimum output requirement. A guaranteed minimum will improve the financeability of a project from an investor's perspective. For the guarantee to mean anything, a creditworthy counterparty is essential. The capture is also likely to ask for reps and covenants to that effect and include transfer restrictions to non-qualified parties. A capture may also wish to include compliance standards to ensure the quality of the CO2. Another concern is protection against outages and other events. This goes back to the natural gas plant example and who bears the risk of outage. The contract term could be a negotiation topic and the capture may ask for a minimum initial term, for example, 12 years from operation. Other negotiation points could focus on access rights and operational issues, and this is due particularly to the fact that the carbon capture equipment is typically located on site, creating shared facility and other similar issues. Moving on to the relationship between captures and storage providers. As mentioned throughout, the tax credits are subject to recapture, and investors may want to build in contractual protections in their documents to ensure an optimal risk allocation. So for example, in this case, the capturer will likely be interested in the following. A ref regarding the adequacy of the storage facility for the carbon capture plan, and this would get granular and include specifications regarding volume, pressure, leakage rate, injection rate. A capturer may also want a covenant to store a minimum of captured CO2 in accordance with an agreed upon CO2 capture plan and without leakage. Exceptions could include terrorist activities or volcanic eruptions as set forth in the proposed regulation. A capture may want an indemnification obligation for recaptured tax credit. This could be for 17 years. There could be discussions about whether a recapture event will be deemed a covenant breach or there should be evidence of fault. And there are scope of liability discussions. Interesting to note that in this case, it's as if the indemnity has a self-effectuating deductible and a self-effectuating tax. A deductible, because as Liz mentioned, nominal leakage does not result in the recapture of credit. Recall that leakage is calculated on a net basis. And a cap, because the indemnity is also to the extent of tax credit recaptured plus cost. Here, the credit worthiness of the storage provider is also key. And the capture may want a rep to that effect and again, a restriction on assignment of the storage agreement and or transfer of the storage facilities to anyone other than a creditworthy counterparty. Conversely, in the context of a storage-only project, a storage provider may be focused on the following terms in its agreement with the capturer. Recall that in this case, the flow of funds is from the capturer to the storage provider. And the latter may want a guaranteed minimum uh, volume commitment. And here, negotiations could revolve around who bears the risk of a producer outage? Who bears the risk of a capture outage? And perhaps also who bears the risk of a pipeline outage between the capture facility and the sequestration facility? Recall that pipelines are generally not part of the equipment, and Liz touched on that um, in her presentation earlier. Another thing a storage provider may be looking for in, uh, is some form of security for the payment of the sequestration fees. Now, first part, the capture may be willing to provide one or more of these, of these apps if it has a satisfactory back-to-back -back arrangement with the producer, which would take us back to the prior slide. And finally, um, a few words on contracts between capturers and industrial off-takers. There are two con key considerations at play here. First is that for utilization and storage CCS projects, the revenue stream generated from the off-taker could be important for the viability of the project especially because the tax credits are not as rich as for storage-only projects. Thus, investors will want to ensure that a minimum of CO2 captured will be purchased in order for them to have a guaranteed revenue stream, for example, or take or pay arrangement, and also that the CO2 is appropriately sequestered in order for them to receive the tax credit. Again, in this case, the creditworthiness of the off-taker will be an important consideration in assessing the financeability of the project. Second, there is still a risk 
uh, recapture risk for leakage in the context of utilization as first CO2 project. And so the capture will likely want the same protections as it would want from a storage provider, but following utilization of the CO2. And these would be, as mentioned in the prior slide, a risk regarding the adequacy of the equipment to receive, utilize, and sequester CO2, a guarantee for the absence of leakage, and an indemnification provision for recaptured tax credits. It is interesting to note that the IRS guidance has provided some structural flexibility. The IRS is allowing take or pay arrangements between the capture on the one hand and the off-taker on the other hand, where the off-taker is a related party to the sponsor, which in most cases is likely to be the producer mentioned at the beginning. This last relationship will have important ramifications in identifying the party's underlying interests and shifting risk allocations when structuring transactions. Thank you, and back to this. Thank you, Martha. That concludes our program for today. We hope that this has provided you with a sound foundation on these issues. And we plan to be performing subsequent webinars and writing alerts on specific topics that we have covered today. Um, please enter any questions you have through the chat feature and we will respond promptly. On behalf of our team, thank you for joining us today.